So for our first talk tonight, what you're going to hear is a discussion on physical modeling synthesis. Now, this is going to be delivered by Dr. Michele Ducheschi, who is a lecturer at the University of Bologna in Italy. Hello. We've got, good evening. We've got Professor Stephen Bilbao from the University of Edinburgh. And we've got Dr. Craig Webb who is currently the CEO of uh, Physical Audio. They're producing high quality audio plugins uh, based on the research which is conducted at the research group, which is the Acoustics and Audio Group at the University of Edinburgh. And um, am I right in thinking that's where you all met is the University of Edinburgh, where you're studying under the supervision of Stefan? That's it, yeah. Uh, Craig and I were students uh, on the master's course in 2009, 2010. So that goes back a long way now. Um, but, uh, you know, we came from sort of different directions. Um, I'm more of a physicist person. I've got a degree in physics. Craig is a computer scientist. Uh, but that is the beauty of that master's course. Um, you know, you find all sorts of people in there, people that have music backgrounds, people that have science backgrounds. Um, but we sort of uh, mingled together at the time, and it was great. Stefan was our um, teacher, of course. And then, um, um, yeah, Craig uh, went on with doing a PhD in Edinburgh. Uh, after the master's, I left and I moved to Paris for my PhD, but I kept in contact uh, with Stefan and with Craig. And then I moved back to Edinburgh um, after my PhD to do uh, some postdoctoral studies. And that is when Physical Audio was born um, around 2016. Uh, we started out with some simple prototypes, but then we really tried to sort of see how far we could go with that, essentially. Um, yeah. Yeah. So this, uh, this came out of a project at Edinburgh called the Nest Project, which uh, we'll talk quite a bit yeah. about um, soon. So, yeah. Nice. Um, yeah, without further ado, let's get started. Cool. So yeah, I thought we'd kind of start with um, with Stefan really, um, and just to kind of really explain what we sort of understand as physical modeling, as opposed to other techniques for like digital sound synthesis. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'll try to I'll try to cover a lot of ground pretty quickly here. Um, so I think like a lot of the old synthesis techniques that people know about. Um, you know, probably don't need to explain, but like the earliest forms uh, were based on say, you know, wavetables um, where you might have like a buffer, you'd fill it with one period of some waveform and then you cycle through it um, repetitively and you generate pitch tones that way. And then people started using more of these um, like to generate more complex sounds like through additive synthesis methods. So you have like a bunch of oscillators running in parallel and then there were other variations too, like running one oscillator into another to get you FM synthesis, for example. And so these are the techniques that developed way back, like in the 60s, um, early 70s. But like the whole time, like bubbling away in the background, people were also working on these other ways to generate sound, like based just on the physics of some object, whether it's a real object, like a musical instrument or something imaginary and trying to like basically simulate them uh, to generate sound. And like, so this started way back. So the very first work was in speech, early 60s, um, but it just continued and it didn't really get any traction until later, until the 80s when computers got faster. Um, and there was a technique called the digital waveguide method, which came out of uh, Karma, which is the big computer music place at Stanford in the 80s. And that's sort of what put that's sort of what made physical modeling um, kind of possible in real time, like in the 90s. And it led to a really great um, Yamaha uh, keyboard called the VL1, which people may remember. And the VL7 19... seven and 70 yeah. as well. So, so this was like 1994. And like at that point, um, the computers were, you know, it gotten even faster and it became possible to go and, and do increasingly complex models of things. Um, and that's kind of been the story ever since. Like we, you know, we have these models, we tend to, you know, work on them like out of real time for a while and then wait for computers to catch up 
and then try to do real time versions of them. And that's exactly where we are with um, with physical audio these days. Is, uh, trying to see like how much we can get out of these uh, out of these models. It can be quite a long wait sometimes. Like yeah, it can. It can be like a ten year plus wait actually. So, but we're patient. Um, so, okay. So that's most of the potted history. Um, so, so just just to uh, interject very quickly and clarify, does this mean that you're uh, looking to? So, normally, when people are creating a stringed instrument or an instrument that's based on an acoustic instrument that has strings or flutes, th things like that, that those would normally be sampled. But just to clarify for people, you're talking about actually recreating this using physical modeling. Is yeah. Exactly. So that that's the big one of the big benefits actually of this uh, way of working is there are no samples at all. So um, so the the codes are very lightweight, you know, um, which is great. Um, so yeah, exactly. So for a string, for example, like the you'd start just on paper and write down like the equation, like that defines a string, and then from there you like on. Continuing on paper, you would develop a, like a computer program, like or a numerical method, and then eventually you, you move into some prototyping framework, and finally, um, an audio programmer will will work it into something that can become real time. So, yeah, that's kind of the workflow, really. Yeah, um, I would like to add a little something to what Stefan has just said. Um, so he gave a brief history of physical modeling, but actually. Um, that goes way back. I mean, um, he talked about mathematical models and mathematical equations, but um, if you go and see what mathematicians did in the 18th century, like the 1700s, um, the first model, the first partial differential equation was actually a, an equation that described the, the vibration of a string. So this idea of describing uh, sound is actually way older than, than the 90s. You know, it goes back to like a few centuries, you know? And it was very interesting the way the, the, the whole thing developed because there were a bunch of mathematicians back then that were arguing about what the actual physical model of the vibrating string was, and they couldn't really agree on a model, you know? And then uh, 50 years later, Fourier came around, the guy that, you know, after which Fourier theory, you know, is named, and he was actually able to consolidate everything into one theory, which is Fourier theory. And that is very interesting because it connects, um, you know, it connects basically all the sides of, of the work that we do within physical audio. It connects the time domain with the modal domain or the frequency domain or the Fourier domain. And, and he was able to show that you can actually move from one picture to the other picture uh, equivalently. So, the, the, you know, regardless of the way you're looking at the problem, you can always end up with the same solution. But that has consequences in terms of how you design an instrument, because sometimes, uh, you know, you can work in the time domain, and that is what we've been doing with the sense that you can find on our website. So derailleur, for example, our preparation, that all works in the frequency in, in the time domain. So you can, um, you know, you have a string and you can tap at different locations and you can go and see what happens, you know, along the string. But then you have a different description, which is um, the modal description or the Fourier description, where instead of looking at the string in, in the time domain in space, uh, you discretize that in terms of resonant frequencies and modes, um, which can also be interesting musically, because obviously at that point you have access to, for example, the resonant frequencies and, and uh, the damping ratios in the frequency domain. Um, so, you know, in theory, you end up with the same thing, but actually that has consequences in terms of how you design the instrument and how people would interact with it. And, and so I think that that is sort of why physical modeling is very interesting and fascinating because you can look at the same problem, but you can solve it in many different ways. And that will have consequences in terms of how people interact with the instrument. Should we briefly just explain some of the sort of major advances that have gone on in physical modeling? Like we sort of briefly touched on digital waveguides and how that, and maybe we could talk about how things have advanced like since that period. Yeah, that sounds great. It, it'd be great as well, I think, for people who are just starting just to hear the difference uh, in your words between time domain and um, and frequency domain, just for people that are just starting that may be getting familiarized to Fourier and uh, and what that actually means. Yeah, I think 
Uh, do you want to do this one, Michaela? Or do you, wanna... uh, you can go. And then maybe uh, I, can... I, I was just going to say something really brief about that. Like, so that for the um, for frequency domain methods, like it's kind of like, like the way you might think about um, additive synthesis. So if you think about building up a string tone, like one, like partial at a time, like that's the approach you would take if you were going to use like a modal method or something. So like a, I don't know, uh, if the fundamental is at 100 hertz for a string, then you'd have all these partials at 200, 300, 400, so on. Um, and you'd build things up that way. But like in the time domain, like you actually, you don't care actually about that. Like all you have is an equation and you just want to solve it, you know? So you're not actually like, um, like imposing any foreknowledge about the solution onto what you're doing. You're just working with a raw equation and solving it like directly, um, almost as though it's like, um, what's, it's almost, it's a bit like, um, like graphics rendering actually. Um, so where you're just, you know, you might be modeling say wave propagation on, a, on the surface of the ocean or something. And that's, it's sort of the same thing as the time domain approach really. I mean, they're, they're different. They have like, they have different strengths and weaknesses. Like sometimes modal methods are like super fast and powerful. Um, just because like for the modes, like each one is just an oscillator and that's super cheap to compute. Um, but then like they, you run into trouble sometimes. Like if you, you know, if you have to deal with some very complicated geometry or something of, of an object, then uh, it's tricky because you need to figure out, first of all, what the modes are what all those frequencies are before you can even start. So there's there, there's just different strengths and weaknesses. Like I'm definitely the time domain person, like for the most part. Michele kind of does both actually, I think, right? Yeah, um, yeah, I'm kind of a lot into this modal methods at the moment and I'm actually uh, developing a prototype for, um, you know, perhaps a new plugin that they might do with physical audio. And that is all entirely made in the modal domain or the Fourier domain. And in this case, like Stefan was saying, basically, you still start with an equation. So you do have a mathematical model behind it. For example, in this case, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm designing an instrument which has a bunch of strings and they're all connected to a plate. And the connections are all nonlinear, so they give rise to a lot of weird resonances. And you know, the, the sound is just absolutely huge. You know. Um, but then again, you start with the system and, and uh, you know, what we do is that we try to write down the equations that describe the system. So um, you have quantities, for example, the displacement of the string and the displacement of the plates. And all these quantities are related mathematically, you know, so you have physical models uh, precisely that, that, you know, describe how all these um, bits are connected together. So, uh, you know, we start from that, but then the way uh, you approach the solution of this system is it can be different. So if you work in the time domain, then like Stefan was saying, you're actually just directly solving the equations. Whereas in the modal domain, you sort of project everything onto this bank of oscillators that are the standing waves of the strings, you know, and, and, of, and of the plate. Um, but the beauty of it is that um, even if you start from a bank of uh, standing waves, you can, you can still reproduce uh, a moving wave front, you know? So eventually what you end up having is, is the same thing. Um, but then, uh, you know, in, in our physical models, um, we place all these virtual microphones on top of these virtual instruments. So you can actually go and listen to the vibrations of a particular object at a particular location. Um, but then the way you go about it is, is different and there are pros and cons of each approach. And um, I kind of like the, yeah, Stefan likes the time domain a lot and I like that too, but um, I think that the modal approach has sort of, the potential of, of the modal approach has sort of been overlooked um, recently, uh, especially when you start having nonlinearities, um, you know, that connect all these subsystems. And nonlinearities are really important because uh, they give rise to a lot of interesting stuff. For example, pitch glides, you couldn't hear them in a string unless you had nonlinearities in it. Or, uh, you know, if you strike a plate, uh, that would not sound like a gong unless you had all these nonlinearities in there, you know? Um, so they're actually really important from a sound synthesis perspective, but modally, this has not been done because, you know, all these standing waves become very densely coupled when you have nonlinearities. So the efficiency of the modal approach sort of gets lost, you know, if you, if you add all these nonlinearities back in. Uh, but what I'm trying to do in my research as well, 
as with physical audio is to actually see if there is an efficient way of, of, of solving all these nonlinearities. And I think, you know, we're kind of close to cracking this problem somehow. Um, and the demos I have, um, you know, are pretty good. So I'm kind of hopeful that maybe we can go somewhere with that approach. Um, but yeah, no, it's, um, you know, it's really fascinating. You know, the whole process is just great. You just start with an equation and then you end up with sound. And I think that's the beauty of it, you know. And where do you, so one question I've always wondered when it comes to physical modeling is where do you start? So let's say you have an instrument that you've never heard before. Let's say it's a stringed instrument and you want to model it. Where do you go first? Do you use a spectrogram, try to take a look at the frequencies that are happening over a space of time? And is, is that what you do? Or are there, is, or am I thinking, is it something uh, different? Let me, uh, I'll try to answer that one. Cause I think depending on who you'd ask, you might get different answers to that one. Um, so like for me, like I'm much more of a kind of work with like equations and books kind of person. So I don't, I'm not really an experimentalist at all, but there are people who do that exactly what you said, you know? So for me, like if it's a string, like, um, you know, there's, there are equations for this. And the tricky thing is to try to find the, like the one that's, like there's whole families of these, right? So for every possible thing you can imagine, there's like hundreds of models, right? And the trick is to find the one that's like sufficiently complex to get you the sound richness that you want, but no, not so complex that it like kills your CPU, you know? So it's always like trying to find that sweet spot of the model, like um, the right one. Uh, but then um, there, I, I mean, there are other people, I think they're, like even like musical like digital musical instrument companies that prefer to work from measurements actually to try to tune things so for example if you're doing a digital piano like it's probably a good idea to go and try to calibrate it against you know real sounds uh because the like the you know there's uncertainties in the numbers that we would get out of books that they could um, easily address just by getting some good numbers so yeah it's kind of it's a good question actually yeah. This, this might be a good point, actually, to sort of talk about one of the other things that's sort of on this list of talking points, which is like, what is the actual point of what we're trying to do? Yeah, like on the one hand, there's trying to model like real actual instruments, maybe they, you know, historical ones in terms of Mikhail stuff, or just literally making up imaginary new instruments. Yeah. So, as I know, like, Stefan, do you have this particular point of view on? This aspect yeah, of like, kind of real versus imaginary stuff. Yeah, like I'm all up for the for the latter of those two, actually. So that's kind of our the real goal is it's not to like do an exact version of a clarinet or something, because that is like I don't know you're competing with you know sample databases and stuff like that, and um, it's not do like you, super. Yeah, do you think it's either? Do you think it's like it. it's not really worth trying to like almost compete with that, like having a big you know sample library of stuff. Well, I think like for, for me, it's just like not all that like, interesting, like to work on, you know, so it kind of it, it would just get really boring, I think, to do that all day. But I think like, you know, if you want to make money and like do a fantastic substitute for these giant sample databases and try to do that, you, you could, you know, um, it's I would I mean, eventually, I think they'll probably get there. But um, but it's a lot of work, actually. And the big problem is like, OK, it's easy for a piano, right, to do that. To build these it depends on the instrument yeah. So, yeah like a piano okay so you have to hit it at you know several different like velocities and then but that's probably that'll cover most of it but then something like a brass instrument like all the note transitions and stuff like you you know all the different valve configurations there's this kind of like so there's always this kind of explosion of yeah. the amount of data you need to represent it there's so always hard. this difference depending on you know what type of instrument you're actually trying to model yeah, so some things kind of more naturally lend itself to, yeah, just having a sample library and that's going to sort of work okay and get you kind of the sound that you yeah. may hope to get. But in other instances, like obviously like brass models and, you know, woodwinds and stuff, there's, you know, trying to get that with samples, it's just, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Why not? Because <laughs> uh, of the transitions, that's the yeah the main thing trying to 
Yeah, like they're all there are all these like really complex interactions. If you imagine like, okay, take the case of a brass instrument, right? Like you, like there, and you suppose you're changing notes like by changing the, you know, the valve positions, right? So like, there's like questions about how fast you do that, how that is synchronized with what you're doing with your lips. And like, that's what you learn as a brass player, right? When you're learning how to play is how to synchronize all these different control streams. But like you can imagine, like every possibility there, like would, like you'd need to be able to capture that somehow with a sample, and it's just like impossible, you know, basically, to to get them all. I would say. Um, so I guess yeah. I mean, um, I suppose that you know, if you look up, if you played, I don't know if you played with uh, our instruments, but um, they're sort of way out there, you know. So, so I think that we really try to explore like uh, the boundaries of physical modeling, and we sort of try to detach ourselves from the idea of actually reproducing the instrument. Uh, but at the same time, the sounds that come out of of our instruments are are sort of real. You know, you can sort of recognize bars and strings in there, but maybe not exactly you know the string that you would hear from a guitar or or a cello. It's something that sounds similar, but also sounds very different. And I think that is sort of that area that we really try to explore because, um, uh, you know, the approach that, that we have, which is to start from models, is actually very flexible in that sense because you can really imagine to, uh, you know, sort of try to push the boundaries of the models and see what comes out of it. And, and most of the time when, you know, we, we, you know, we make this stuff and then we talk to musicians and sound designers and, and the first thing they ask is, oh, I want to play a string that is seven kilometers long or something, you know. So they always, that everybody's fascinated by that idea. You do. Um, That's absolutely true. Like it's, it's always the first thing. It's know? always the first thing they ask. I want to play a, a huge instrument. Um, but there is a reason why, you know, there is a reason why instruments are not that big. It's because they sound rubbish, you know? So, so, you know, the dimensions actually matter. So you can try to make a very long string, but, you know, before you excite frequencies in the audio domain, you know, it takes, it takes a while. And, and sometimes the result is, is, is not as exciting as, as the idea, you know? Um, but it is possible to do that somehow. And, and, um, and I think that, you know, with physical audio, we actually try to, uh, create instruments that are sort of flexible in that sense, so people can explore them and, and see what sounds they get and if they're happy with it. Um, but at the moment, yeah, we haven't really tried to replicate sounds of actual musical instruments. So I don't know if that's a good business strategy or not, but we like to do that. I mean, I always view it as like, you kind of after like real acoustic quality to the sounds. That's like super yeah. important. And also trying to have some kind of element of like dynamic expression. Yeah. Because, you, know, you know, obviously with a sampled instrument, you know, just playing it from a keyboard, you get fixed into that very sort of static thing where it doesn't feel very alive. Whereas with our stuff, we're really trying to make the thing have some kind of you know, actual dynamic expression. So when you, you, know, you play at different velocities, you, you know, use a mod wheel, et cetera, it actually feels like you're playing a real instrument. That's kind of the, that's where we're trying to sort of get to. But I guess, Craig, uh, the complicated part in all this process is how um, you parameterize everything in terms of a MIDI controller, right? Yeah, so the parameter control thing could be a bit of a pain, like obviously. Um, so there's always this thing that the, the models kind of start with these sort of list of parameters, and these are like physical parameters, things like, you know, tension and the radius of a string and all that kind of stuff. But actually then trying to translate that into things that you can move and control in real time can be much more complicated, yeah. It's not always obvious like how to, how to make that work. So for instance, like without the plate reverb, like do you want to briefly explain some of what happens with the plate reverb? Um, yeah, uh, we, yeah, we, you know, that, that was our first, uh, plugin actually, you know, and this goes back like five or six years now. So again, um, for reverbs, uh, we thought it would be a good idea to start to, to develop them in, in the modal domain, uh, because in, 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 you know, in this system, you actually have a bunch of, uh, resonant oscillators and they're all, they're all running in parallel. So, um, that's pretty efficient computationally as well, because you're just solving each one of the modes independently, and then you sum up the contributions together. 
Um, but then, uh, you know, we kind of wanted to have some dynamic aspects to it, you know, so if you play around with our reverb, you can actually shrink the plate or, or, or make it bigger and that works in yeah. real time. But obviously that has complications in terms of how you compute the modes and everything. Um, so, you know, it takes a bit of tinkering, but um, still it is possible. The original idea obviously was to have a plate. So we have this plate reverb and we always wanted to be able to like drag the size of the plate around on the screen. So you have a little image of the plates, little drag handle, and actually change the size because the, the dimensions of the plate are part of the, you know, the fundamental kind of setup to it. But actually getting to the point where it's a real time thing was not straightforward. So, and like in our initial versions, we were doing things like reacting to mouse up to do like to trigger a state reset, things like that. Um, and to actually get to the point where we can do it in real time and continuously change the size of the plate, that took maybe, I don't know, like probably two months of work. Mm. You spent a lot of time like, working on that, trying to figure out how we're actually going to make this thing work in a real time scenario. And these things can be, they don't always come up in the prototyping and such. Like it's very easy to kind of prototype stuff in MATLAB as a physics simulation, but kind of forget about how it might work in a real time scenario. Yeah, so that's always, that's always stuff that comes up like all the time. Like I should say though on that though, like we, I think over the years we've learned, like those of us who work in MATLAB to do the prototyping have kind of learned how to, um, I don't know, like target the things we do towards real time eventually. Like, I think the early codes that was certainly true. Like I would, I might have some operation in there and Craig would be like, we can't do this. Well, and you know, normalization or, as well. That's always like, yeah, that, that we sorted read, out. But, yeah. yeah. But that we're, I think we're actually sorting that one out, you know? So. Yeah. Good. Um, so we, okay. We've actually used quite a bit of time. Should we briefly talk about um, the projects actually? Because they're kind of quite important. Do you, Stefan, do you want to sort of briefly talk about the uh, Nest projects? Yeah. Okay. So I'll just I'll tell you a bit about the project that went on from uh, this is from 2012 to 2016. So this was um, a European Research Council funded project, and it was um, there was 12 people on it in total, I think, and it was all about like um, trying to explore like as many different types of physical models of musical instruments as possible, all offline. So there's no attempt to do anything in real time in that project. So we did, you know, wind instruments, stringed instruments, uh, keyboard instruments, um, percussion. And we also worked a lot in 3D, which is a thing we haven't talked about today because that's still way out of real time. But we would, you can actually yeah, that was go. That my thing, yeah. Yeah, that was Craig's sort of PhD project. But you can go and embed a physical model of something like, say, a timpani drum in a room and place virtual microphones in the room and listen to it. And those are heavy simulations even now. So um, we should point out that, so that timpani drum simulation, which sounds cool because it's like a 3D thing, it would take an hour to get one second of sound out of it. And that was processing like on this really high-end GPU cluster. It's like NVIDIA Tesla cards and stuff. But that was 2012, right? So I don't think it's got much faster now. Yeah, yet, probably though. not. It would probably still take yeah. half an hour to get one second of um, sound out of this model at you know running at a full audio rate of like 44.1 so those so, are very much yeah so like basically like a big part of the project was just like the raw kind of algorithm design like trying to figure out like the math the you know, like how to code these things so that was like the bulk of it and then there was a team within it that was devoted to um parallelization like working on gpu and what we ended up with in the end was a kind of a system that like, like composers could log into our GPU machine and run offline jobs. It was kind of like a like 70s style synthesis, right? So they, they'd send in some very kind of obscure looking scored instrument description or something and then wait, and then the sound would come out. And we did whole pieces that way. Um, but they're really interesting, like, cause you could also, you can get like, you know, multi-channel out. So we were really into like 16 channel, 32 channel pieces where you might have many microphones, like either on an instrument or in a space or something. And so we worked with a lot of composers. It was like super fun. I miss it like terribly. It was like the best time. Um, and then 
once that was done, then we started looking at what parts of that could become real time. And that's how physical audio started, was looking at the kind of the, you know, the ashes of that project and trying to pick things out of it, you know. So and then maybe Michaela should talk about Nemus then. Yeah, um, I also have a NRC funded project now uh, here in Bologna. And uh, this is actually going into a sort of different direction because different direction because so far we said we aren't trying to do real instruments, but actually what I'm trying to do within this research project is actual historical instruments. Um, so the idea is that, uh, you know, there are a bunch of instruments in museums all around the world that are out of point condition and, and they cannot be restored because they're really old and precious. So maybe you have the signature, you know, the people that made it on the soundboard and you can't just replace it with a different soundboard just because you want to play it, you know? Um, so you have a bunch of these instruments like everywhere. And um, the idea is to make use of this digital te technology that is physical modeling in order to reproduce the sound of these historical instruments. Um, I think the idea is, is very valuable and, and very exciting. And obviously, you know, it, it, even with the pandemic, we came to realize how difficult it is even to get people in the same place together at the same time, you know? So perhaps if we could have, um, you know, a digital copy of these instruments, then maybe people can just download it from a website and play it. Um, and so the, this idea is, is really, really great. But obviously here, you know, I'm trying to actually make the sound of, of a real instrument. And I'm talking to a lot of early music people and, and musicologists. And, you know, um, I really have to get into you know, the tiny details here, because um, if it doesn't sound good, these people are just not going to like it, you know, and they just go, okay, this idea is rubbish. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in Italy and I'm talking to a lot of, um, you know, harpsichord makers and I'm gonna get soundboards built in this case. So I'm gonna run experiments and try to get as much information from, um, you know, the copies as, as, as possible. Um, and then I'm trying to use that information that comes from the experiments uh, with the physical models, the mathematical models. And hopefully, you know, something will come out of it that sounds interesting and reasonable. Um, but I think that the idea is really, really powerful. And this is an alley of physical modeling that is also very exciting. And that I'm seeing a bunch of different research projects, projects around the world that are sort of uh, playing around the same idea. And I think, you know, we're going to see more of that in the future. So I don't know, tune in in five years and I'll tell you how that went. <laughs> cool. Um, should we ever listen to some little sound yeah. demo to this point? I think, yeah. So we have a new plugin uh, that we released a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so we work with um, a composer and sound designer called Gaddy Sassoon, who's based in Milan, I think it's right. Um, and he was part of the Nest project originally, so he he did some of that kind of offline processing work basically with the Nest project. Um, and he's done some little sound demos of uh, the latest plugin, so I thought we can actually have a listen to some stuff. Okay, so this is our latest uh, release, and this is based on physical modeling of prepared strings. So we have a model that looks like this. So we've got two strings and then there's this thing which is basically a rattle. So this rattle kind of sits on the strings and sort of bounces up and down in reaction to the stuff that's going on on each string, yeah. So it's kind of like the idea of a, a prepared piano kind of thing. And so here's a couple of demo tracks by Gaddy.
I'll just do two more. Okay, so that, yeah, that's some demos by uh, Gaddy Sassin. How did you guys like them? Really awesome. A lot of great feedback in the uh, chat. A lot of people cool. think that it sounds very fascinating. And yeah. I should explain. So each, each of those is just an individual preset, basically. So Gaddy, I gave uh, Gaddy a, a beta and he came up with a bunch of presets. And those demo tracks are basically from an individual preset and it's him basically just playing around with the preset. So, yeah. yeah, there is little like production on the on the tracks, right, Craig? I think he did a bit of EQing, but that was about it. So the sound, basically, if you go through the presets, it pretty much basically sounds like that. So, yeah. And how long did that instrument take to build from beginning to end? That's an interesting um, question, well, actually. The, okay, so the that's it has a long history that one. So the original, I'll try to keep it short. So the, the original version of that was coded in. Um, well, there's a there's a very very old version from 2009. Which well, we're talking pre preparation though, it's slightly different. Yeah, right? preparation, but the whole yeah. like process of this is this gone all the way back there to 2009, and then there was version the the main version you're working from is from 2016, I think, right? uh roughly and then preparation has been a couple of years right probably yeah so basically um so the original kind of matlab prototypes were done like two years ago and they were just trying to start off with something which is very simple which is that kind of that little animation which is ha to have two strings connected together with this kind of rattle guy and trying to work out how to do, so we were also doing a non-linear string. So one of those strings, one at the top is a non-linear string, and then one at the bottom is linear. And so, yeah, we spent quite a lot of time kind of basically trying to figure out how to get the best um, CPU usage, because the CPU usage was like, yeah, it can be crazy trying to do that stuff. And the collision modeling is, it gets you know, very computationally expensive. So yeah, altogether it's, it's probably, yeah, probably a bit, about two years in total mm. working on and off you know not completely two years of work but yeah that yeah. sort of time scale yeah but I, but I guess this instrument also shows uh somehow how we like to work together right because there is the academic process first and the ideas that come out we're actually pretty open about our designs so if you look up like papers that we publish you find pretty much everything in there you know yeah. in terms of like the mathematical modeling but then, then when when we figure that out, you know, um, the actual 
uh, making of the plugin didn't take all that long, right, Craig? Because once we actually figured out how yeah. to make it fast, then you had all the knowledge to, to make it. And yeah. it probably took you like, like three or four months. Yeah, there's always that, that kind of initial stage of working through the MATLAB codes. So I should explain, we, we always start with some MATLAB. Then we try and go to some sort of basic C++ just to see roughly what it's going to look like. And then there's the, the, the next step of trying to get like actual optimized code. You know, something that you know, have some clue that it's going to work in real time and try and deal with things like vectorization on the CPU and all that kind of, that kind of business. But once, and that's all done offline. So at that point, we're still just like writing sound to a WAV file. Yeah. But once you've got all that kind of stuff figured out, it's then, yeah, not such a great leap to actually kind of embed that in an engine and then after that you're just dealing with like user interface you know the usual kind of nightmare stuff that actually takes a while yeah yeah so yeah it actually yeah a few it's a good few months work to actually get everything you know pulled together with the ui and the engine and midi control etc cetera, etc cetera. So. and who do you find are people who are most interested in these types of instruments with, of course, I think a lot of people would think film composers and uh, things like yeah. that. Yeah, sound, sound design is kind of something we do definitely target. And then, I mean, people like Gaddy, he's, he's an experimental composer. Yeah, so he, he just, he's kind of like on the edge of the spectrum of, you know, dealing with electronic music. Yeah, but he does, he does some sound design work as well. So it's that kind of, yeah, a mixture of sound design and experimentalists, I guess. Yeah. Where, where do you feel that it's going? Do you feel that it, that it has any potential to get into the mainstream market or will it always be experimental? Um, I'd kind of hope we're sort of making sort of baby steps towards getting, yeah, obviously it's taken a while to, you know, to get to the stage where we can actually have, you know, professional plugins, et cetera. There's the whole learn and juice side of it, you know, stuff you're, you're familiar with. But yeah, we're kind of, we're aiming to have, you know, by the time we've got like a suite of these kind of instruments, maybe some effects and that as well. Yeah, we're hoping, we do type, try and sort of target or make them usable by, you know, mainstream people. We're not specifically just saying, you know, you have to be some weird out there experimental guy. But Although we like these people. We do, like yeah. People. There are people. Really, I, I can completely see some style of music coming out, something like what dubstep was in the early 2010s, where you had this really far reaching sound design that was completely different from anything else that had come before it. I could completely see some really different style of music come, at, come out using these types of instruments. We would, we would love that, obviously, yeah. It's about it's about initially making those contacts to you know work with interesting composers. That's what we're, that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, I mean, um, there is also the option of like making um, banks of samples of these instruments, you know, and then like manipulate the samples, you know, in all sorts of different ways to actually use them in the music production, you know. So there is that side that we haven't really explored yet, but it is definitely a possibility. So you know, techno music people out there. I'm talking to you. <laughs> or drum and bass. Or okay. drum and bass. <laughs> uh, we have a couple questions from the audience. Uh, Gabriel asks, can you talk a little bit about the stochastic start? Difficult to model with FFT, but plausible with partials modeling. I'm not sure what that means, but maybe it means something to, to you. Um, that was related. Um, I apologize to Gabrielle if that was actually related to something in the moment that you that they had actually been discussing. But I think we were talking. They were talking. Uh, you were talking at the time a little bit about <clears throat> the uh, the nuances of acoustic instruments, the actual blowing motion or the the actual finger hitting the string, and and um, I think. If, if, if I'm reading a little bit into what they're asking, it's about how do you actually create that? How do you actually model those in, in harmonic parts of, of the instrument that are not uh, the actual harmonic? 
combat? Well, I guess the, the answer there is, is pretty simple. Like you just stick as close to the physics as you can and you just get them. They come out automatically, you know? So for example, like if you, uh, really quick, I'll say like, if you do like a wind instrument with holes on it, like, you know, like when you, if you learn how to play the clarinet or something, most of the time, like if you don't cover the holes, you're going to get squeaks and things. Mm. And like, you get the same things out of the physical model. Right. And that's because it's actually because you've done the modeling faithfully that you get all these kind of weird, uh, sort of effects and things, which is, we want those, you know, like they're desirable for us. Um, so yeah, the answer is just like, be, you know, super careful with your, with your model and don't and just neglect things, you know, because they might be interesting, you know, so. Yeah. Uh, Steve Dwyer had a question that was, that was very similar to that. So I'll, I think I, I think we'll leave it at that. Uh, George has a question. Uh, is the source code for any of the Nest project open source or available for licensing? I think I, I owe George an email. I know who this is actually. Uh, so yeah, I think I wrote and said that uh, it is not available, unfortunately, um, partly because we're sort of thinking about what to do for uh, physical audio, actually. So I, can, I think that's the answer. So no, we haven't. And I think actually most of it is geared towards running on the GPUs anyway. So I don't know if it'd be so useful. It's, it's like very kind of weird code, like it's CUDA, a lot of it. Um, so I'm not sure how useful that would be to release. So I don't know. So sorry about that, George. Um, I had, I had a question, um, that may be completely off base. Are there any, are, are there any useful ways that machine learning can be brought into this field of physical modeling? Because when, one of the first things that I thought of was, uh, in my relatively small experience with machine learning. It's great for these tasks that are dis difficult to describe in, uh, in code, but maybe something that you could demonstrate and that you can ask a model to actually imitate that for you. Have, has that been an approach that you've thought about or that you've tried, or do you think that I'm speaking complete rubbish and that has no, uh, no useful, <laughs> no useful application? No, it's, I, I think you're very right. And actually, I uh, know neural nets and machine learning are a big part of digital audio conferences these days. So until like a few years ago, you wouldn't see any paper related to like, you know, AI or anything like that. But now if you go to DAFX, the DAFX conference, digital audio effects, you'll find at least half of the papers that have like neural nets in them. Um, so it's definitely a big thing. Um, there are a lot of uses for that. And I guess one of them is to sort of play with this gray or black box sort of thing where basically you have a bunch of data coming in from like a guitar pedal or something, you know, and then you ask a neural net to sort of replicate that. And they're really good at doing that. So if you're actually able to set up the, the you know, the neural network appropriately, then you'll get like a very good copy of, of the thing out of it, you know? Um, so, you know, if you want to call that physical modeling, then I guess, yes, it's a big trend, but, um, I guess we're kind of like on a different end of the spectrum here. So, um, you know, so long as we're not really trying to replicate the sound of a particular piece of gear, we're sort of free to experiment with the mathematical models. So for us at the moment, like this kind of techniques are not part of the mix, but they might well, there be is, the... There is that aspect of trying to use AI to sort of explore parameter spaces. Like, like Stefan, maybe that's like, yeah, that, like that's that. true. Actually, like it's, um, yeah. like for some instruments, um, like, uh, like the, the very first modular network I did had like upwards of 400 parameters that you'd have to set, like for each run. And it's just, it's like impossible to explore. And unfortunately, like a large part of it just sounded kind of like the same sludge, but then every once in a while, you kind of find a cool vein of sounds like, and you have to kind of edge along this little tiny bit of the parameter space to to find stuff so i don't know in some ways it's more like data mining than it is like machine learning actually like in some way you're trying to find you're like to pull out um interesting like features from the space and that is that's still kind of a big open problem we don't know what to do about that one um so <laughs> Got it. to be continued um Jasks at, Jas asks a question that you addressed a little bit earlier, but I don't think Jas was along the ride at that point. So maybe I'll, I'll let you explain it briefly again. 
Uh, what do you use to perfect a model of an acoustic instrument? Is it more of an AI learning or do you go by a regular process of F FFT synthesis to get the timbral changes? Either one, actually. Yeah, there's no FFTs uh, in our codes. I don't think we've ever used one. Yeah, so, uh, and no machine learning. So it's just pure physics, actually. That's it. Um, so simple I guess, answer there. Yeah, I guess perhaps like we talk uh, to sound designers at some point, you know, during the process, and then they can direct us into precisely exploring the parameter space. But what we adjust is uh, the physical parameters of the objects. So, um, you know, that, 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 that comes into play at some point, but it's literally just more like adjusting, you know, numbers in the, in the models rather than looking at spectra. Hmm. I, I had a really cr interesting question. Have you ever tried to work to a brief before where somebody has actually said, I want to make an instrument like this. It's kind of like a guitar, but kind of like a harp. Uh, have you ever tried to do that before? Yeah, I, I've done that actually with composers uh, back in the old days. And it, I found it usually like, like it doesn't work, but then like along the way, there's some sidetrack that they get interested in, you know, anyway. So, uh, cause like, I don't know, it's like the, the typical one is like a, something that speaks or something, right? That's a big one people want. They want a, a violin that talks or something. And then, I don't know, you kind of scratch your head for a while and then give them something else and then. And then they change their mind, you know. I don't know. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's hard. I don't know because because composers don't know what they want. Like, because I was asked like them first, like, what do you want? And they, and they they just say like, I don't know. What have you got? You know. So they want to just be given something cool to play with, and then they'll find something. But they they don't want to dream things up really, uh, so much. So, yeah. Going back to what you were saying about clients is that sometimes they want a lot of things and sometimes those things can be conflicting <laughs> can you make it speak but can you make it not speak so much <laughs> uh, thanks so much that was really fascinating and a lot of people found that really interesting well thank you that was very interesting you know to be able to talk about physical modeling here so thanks for hosting us i guess and thanks for, you know, the people watching. Yeah. Yeah, that Thank was great. You. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I learned so much from that. Really interesting. I just wanted to ask, is there, um, is there any like resources or books that you would recommend for someone wanting to get started with physical modeling synthesis? Yeah, Stefan has a book. It's very good. Uh, I do. <laughs> but I, I actually wanted to recommend um, Julius Smith's. Uh, uh, he's got online books. So he's the, um, the waveguide mm. master at, uh, at uh, Stanford. And he's yeah. got this huge web page, something called the Global Index. And you can just kind of dip into it and go from there. It's great, actually. I use it all the time. So nice. Yeah, those his books have helped me so much. Oh, you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And I they're think free, they're available, too. yeah, on the DSP related as well, mm -hmm. Stanford. Yep. Awesome. I'm back and the dog is calm again. <laughs> so, uh, great. Okay. Thank you very much, Stefan, Michelle, and Craig. And uh, once again, if you'd like to check out their plugins, you can check that out at uh, physicalaudio.co.uk. And uh, I will be sure to put their, the links in the description so you can uh, check them out there.